I am so happy you're here. Thank you so much for coming out. Really appreciate it. When we launched this book club, we weren't sure what we were going to do or how we were going to do it, but we knew we wanted to have our listeners involved. So it really means a lot to me and to all of Team All of It that you're here. So thank you very much, first of all. Let me get myself situated here. Um, I want to do a little, little radio magic because we're going to turn this around for tomorrow's show. So have any of you been to like a TV talk show taping? Yeah, no? Okay, so I'm going to do a very enthusiastic intro to the show, and then you're all going to clap, okay? <laughs> you're going to go in three, two. This is All of It on WNYC. Welcome to our very first Get Lit with All of It book club. Three, two. We'll have more of the Get Lit with All of It book club right here on WNYC. <laughs> Three, two. Thanks to all of you who came out and everybody who's been listening on the radio. We hope you had as much fun as we did. Get ready for number two coming up of the Get Lit with All of It book club. Okay, business is over. <laughs> all right, let's, you know, we did promise you wine, as we mentioned. So I would like to introduce, I'm going to try this. I took Spanish, not French. Ready? Melis Chevrier. Perfect. Oh, our sommelier of the evening. Everybody welcome, Maurice. Hi, good evening. Maurice, by the way, is the author of a new book called Grasping the Grape, Demystifying Grape Varieties to Help You Discover the Wines you love. All right, so you helped us out tonight. You yes. picked the two wines that people are drinking. Correct. You selected them specifically with this book, The Lady in the Lake, and mine. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so tell me about the white that you've chosen. So the white that we're drinking is a Chenin Blanc. It's a grape. Um, it's interesting. It has a lot of different personalities based on where it's grown, who's manipulating it, what have you. <laughs> it can be incredibly dry, super sweet, off dry, dessert. Um, sparkling even. So this particular one is from South Africa. They make, generally speaking, a really lean style of Chenin Blanc, which is just like bright and kind of like electric grapefruit acidity and just like a nice dry, like friendly wine, but something perhaps different than like your Sauv Blanc or your, um, you know, Gruner Veltliner or that thing like that. So it's kind of a nice one to get into and also a, a pretty friendly price point too, most often than not. Um, for the, you Can know, I try it? <laughs> Yeah, let's okay, try it. Can we drink it? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> by the way, these wines are available at the bar. We just want to let you know. Uh, so wait, you said electric grapefruit acidity? Yeah. That's a great name for a band. Wouldn't it be? Yeah. <laughs> All right. And you said price point. I don't mean to be gauche, but what's the price point? I mean, I, I would recommend you can find good things if you're looking for inexpensive between like $10 and $15 is usually like a it. sweet spot for that kind of thing. Our best, like, who, has, who has the white out there? Who's drinking it? Yeah. What do you think? Good. It's good? What would you serve it with? Anything? <laughs> Cheese. What would you serve this with? I would do like anything with a lot of acid. I like to pair with a little bit of fat or even something with richness because it kind of acts like something that'll just cut it right through. And why did you choose it to go with our book, Lady in the Lake? Because I thought the, the character, Maddie, had so many different personalities. It kind of develops a lot of different personalities throughout the book that was a pretty fitting, fitting match for that. Love that. Again, the name? Uh, Cape and Dava is the wine itself, and then Chenin Blanc is the grape. All right. The red. The, the red, red is a Barbera Dava, so it's a grape that you see mostly in Piedmont in northwestern Italy, Ooh. which um, is best known for Nebbiolo, which is a grape that makes like the king of wines. It makes Barolos, Barbarescos, and that's kind of like a little bit of Barbera's plight in that it gets overshadowed a lot. It's kind of like in the sidelines. It makes great, delicious, like really juicy red wines, great for fall. You can have, or in like even the summer, you can serve it with like a little bit of chill. A lot of red fruits, a little bit herbal, but not too tannic. So it's a really pretty like friendly, red wine, and again, kind of like in a similar, I think if you're like doing a book club, you're gonna be drinking a lot, you don't want anything that's like super expensive, break the bank kind of, kind <laughs> of wines. Um, but I picked it for the book also just because I thought it was a good comparison between the two cases. You know, you've got one that's completely kind of like swept under the rug almost, and then another one that's like right in the spotlight. So that'll be kind of fun to This is an absolutely that. serious question. You said it's a friendly wine. What's yes. an unfriendly wine? 
<laughs> well, Nebbiolo is a really unfriendly wine. Because, what, what does that mean if wine is unfriendly? Um, it can mean a lot of different things, but in that particular example, it's like, that's a grape that's really tannic. It's particularly um, difficult to grow, and so it makes it expensive. You have to wait a long time to have it, and it's just like pretty intense. It's better with food. Friendly wines to me are wines that you can just have on like a pizza night kind of wine, you know, like chuggable in the best way possible. <laughs> you know, and nothing wrong with that. Who's, ha who's tried this? Who's got it? What do we think? We like? Oh, that is really good. Yeah, I'm usually a white wine gal, but I really like this. Yeah. Oh, was I supposed to do that? I'm sorry. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Force of habit. <laughs> it's really good. Mm -hmm. So everybody, this is probably your last chance. I'm going to ask Maurice a couple more questions, but if you want to try one of these two wines, bartender is waiting for you. We're going to let bartender loose in a little bit, so feel free. You won't, you won't be rude by getting up and go get a drink right now before we start the whole show for real. Um, tell me about your book. So essentially, it's like a, it's like a pocket guide to, and I cl say cliff notes in like the best possible way, a guide to a wine, focusing on wine grapes. A lot of what I talk about in the book, and there's about 30 varietals profiled, is attaching them to a personality in the way that I kind of was mm -hmm. um, just now, where because I, I find it a little bit easier to to get into and to not talk about it in such like a wine speaky kind of way. You know, I say Chardonnay is like the girlfriend who changes for each boyfriend she has, because it's a totally <laughs> neutral grape, and some people love it in one expression and like hate it in another. Um, you know, Riesling is the the player that's totally typecast. Everybody thinks it's sweet, but it actually also has a full range of flavors. So it's about making wine accessible and fun and also has a lot of like, you know, rosé frequently asked questions, a whole guideline to things, uh, to regional place names so that you know that Chablis equals Chardonnay, Sancerre equals Sauvignon Blanc if it's white, that kind of thing. So it's a nice, a nice gifty kind of coffee table book. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to put so much Thank energy and thought into yeah. the wines for our book club. Absolutely. It's the name of pleasure. the book, again, is Grasping the Grape, Demystifying Grape Varieties to Help You Discover the Wines You Love. I think I love this one. Yeah, I like the red. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank being with us. Thank you, guys. Take care. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to stay on schedule and get you guys out of here by 8.30. Ah, but it might not be possible because this book was so good. All right. Ladies and gentlemen of the Get Lit with All of It book club, you spent all month reading her latest novel along with us as part of our very first book club. You picked up Lady of the Leak Lake earlier this summer or you're a lifelong fan of her work. No one in this room can deny that Laura Lippman is the queen of mystery. She's achieved acclaim for her Tess Monahan novels and her previous standalone book, Sunburn, was one of the hottest books of 2018. But before she became a crime novelist, did you know that Laura Lippman spent 20 years as a journalist? And she put those years of experience to good use in Lady in the Lake. Set in 1960s Baltimore, the novel centers around two women who have more in common than one might think. Our main narrator is the newly liberated housewife, Maddie Morgenstern, who turns her life upside down in order to make a name for herself as a journalist. And the case she just won't let go, the murder of a black woman, Cleo Sherwood, who Maddie dubs the lady in the lake. And as Maddie continues to dig around Cleo's past, we hear from the ghost of the lady in the lake herself, who is not that happy with Maddie's investigation. Sometimes, Cleo argues, it's just better to leave things alone. Lady in the Lake defies all expectations of a crime novel in true Laura Lippman fashion, and here to tell us about it herself is Laura Lippman. They brought me some wine. You're, you are welcome. I, I had to taste these, these carefully chosen wines. I was so overwhelmed and amazed at that presentation. I was very thoughtful and lovely. And delicious. Yeah. Let's put that, too. Some way to find that. All right, we're going to get into it, Laura. Okay. This group has been reading along. Our whole staff has been reading along. I thought it was so interesting to learn that this is based on two real-life stories. Yes. Tell us about these real life stories. So, to sort of explain, I mean, I started off knowing only that I wasn't in, in 2017, writing about the present day suddenly seemed impossible. 
I, I felt that we had entered an era, and that's not a partisan opinion. It's like we had entered this era in which everything was at once extremely frenetic and extremely static. I felt like every friend I had just ran back and forth between their laptop and the TV and like, this will change everything. And the next day, nothing had changed. And, and here we are. So I was like, I can't write about the present right now. I don't know what I want to say about the times we're living in. I'm going to need some time to think about that. And I began looking toward the past. And I was initially drawn to 1966 because there was an election in Maryland, the governor's race, which had a lot of parallels with the presidential race of 2016. And then as I went back for it, I thought, yeah, I'm not really, I don't want to write a political novel, Evelyn. I don't mm -hmm. want to write about a governor's race. But I knew about these two deaths that actually occurred in 1969. And one of them in real life was the death of an 11-year-old girl named Esther Leibowitz. And because I was the daughter of a newspaper man, because I was probably already planning to grow up to be a journalist, I had read everything about that case when I was 10 years old. You know, I was like that weird little kid with the oh, afternoon wow. newspaper. And so I knew everything about that case. I, I knew that a girl had disappeared, that her body was found, a man had been charged and convicted of her murder. But there was a death of a woman named Shirley Parker, and I never heard a word about it until I went to work at the Baltimore Sun more than 20 years later. And Shirley Parker's body had been found in the lake same year. And her disappearance was not news. And the discovery hmm. of her body was probably only news because of the mystery of where she was found, how did she get there, what happened, because there was never an official ruling in her death. They never determined the cause of death, so they couldn't rule it a homicide. If she'd been found in an alley or the trunk of somebody's car, she might not have even been a news story. And that seemed to be a very interesting contrast to me. But how do you bring those two stories together? Mm -hmm. And you, one could create like some vast conspiracy in which the deaths were literally connected. But instead, I thought, I have to create a character who somehow would be connected to both of these deaths. She is the connection. And that's where Maddie came from. And listeners, I just want to make sure everybody knows there could be spoilers in this conversation. We're not aiming for them. But it could happen. You've been warned. <laughs> if you haven't finished, it's on you. <laughs> well done. So in the writing process, as you're writing a novel that's purely from your imagination versus one that's based on two real life stories, how is the writing process different then? It's not as different as you might think. When I, I'm often inspired by real life stories, and I I'm very careful. I, I never say things are ripped from the headlines. To me, that suggests something kind of sloppy and careless. I'm inspired by real life stories, but I'm inspired by thematic things. You know, in this case, it was a little white girl died and everybody knew about it. An African American woman in her 20s died and no one seemed to know and no one seemed to care. And I really couldn't see that um, 2019 was that different from 1966, and I think we're kidding ourselves if we think it is. So I was drawn to those ideas. Once I've identified real life cases that are of interest to me, I, am, I do no research. I want to know as little about them as possible. I don't want real life to take over. So now I'm off on my own, and I find that I'm I'm really willing to take liberties with a lot of the public record. You know, it's it's not a real story. I'm not, and it's not a famous story. Like, if you're going to write a, a novel that was inspired by the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby, you do have to kind of hew closer to the record because that's a known story. It's already in the public imagination. Most people had never heard of either of these cases. I mean, people in Baltimore were familiar Somewhere, uh, my own mother, by the way, told me, said, Laura, did you realize that I worked with Esther Leibowitz's father? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> didn't know wow. that. Until, that. That was something my mom told me after the book was published. So, um, yeah, I felt, but it, what was very different about this book is I decided to put some real people in it. You know, not many, but there are these characters that pass by fleetingly in the book. Uh, the first African-American police officer, who was, in fact, a woman, um, known as Lady Law. 
that was a real character. And there's a brief chapter told from the point of view of Baltimore Orioles center fielder Paul Blair. And I just felt like, well, they should be in there. I just, you know, they're, they're part of 1966. They're part of the story. What was it about 1960s Baltimore that you wanted all of us, the reader, to know? And, and something that you wanted us to know that helped us understand these characters and their lives? You know, when people write about the 60s, I think the tendency has been, certainly there have been other books written in the mid-60s, but for the most part, when the 60s enter the public imagination, it's often the early 60s because the Kennedy assassination is so often portrayed as, you know, America's lost innocence. And then we look at 68 and 69, which are these years of enormous upheaval and everything is changing having just wandered into 66 almost by happenstance, I became fascinated with it. It's a real hinge year. Uh, I, it's funny because um, I'm, I'm literally working on my taxes now because my husband and I don't file until October 15th. <laughs> we needed an extension. And I, I saw this very day, I saw an entry and I was like, that's when I bought in February of 2018 I bought a book called 1966 at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame bookstore in Cleveland, where I was on book tour for my previous book. And the book 1966 tells the story of the year through the number one singles. And it's a fascinating That's book. So it's cool. a terrific book. It was um, published, I think, by Faber and Faber out of the UK. And one of the details that jumped out at me, it's the author's observation is that this is a year in which, at the beginning of the year, one of the number one singles is King of the Road by Roger Miller. And by the end of the year, one of the number one singles in the United States will be Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones. That's an interesting year. <laughs> that's a culture that's changing quickly and changing rapidly. And I was like, this is a hinge year. This is like, maybe we don't think of 1966. I mean, it's also, then I'm just there and I find out, you know, it's before loving the case that will make interracial marriage legal in the United States. It is literally the year that the Baltimore City Police Department will become integrated under a new commissioner. At the beginning of 1966, black police officers in Baltimore, they could be patrolmen, they could be vice undercover. They weren't allowed in patrol cars. They weren't allowed to have radios. And all of that's going to change by the end of 66 when a new commissioner comes in and starts fast tracking the integration of the department. And it was just like detail after detail. Just, you know, once you sort of pick a year. I mean, I'm a big fan of the writer Bill Bryson. I'm also a big fan of Gene Weingarten of the Washington Post, who this year published a book called One Day, where he just told stories that happened about a single arbitrary day that was determined by having kids like draw dates out of a hat in a bar. And, and, and Bill Bryson did this amazing book called One Summer, which is the history of the summer of 1927, which is Lindbergh's, the year of Lindbergh's flight. And it's when you focus closely enough on a year, a place, you will find amazing stories. I was getting the chills, if I can tell you, because I was born in 1966. Oh. So I'm thinking about my parents, and my sister's 10 years older than I am. So I'm thinking about my parents bringing, having a 10-year-old and then bringing another child into the world in this year you just described, what it yeah. must have been like for a young black couple it, at that time. Know, it's a really scary, and another thing too is that as you start reading the newspapers, you realize once again, and this is where you see this parallel between now and then, the people who are most at risk of violence and crime are African Americans. You know, sort of these, th that there's this exaggerated white fear of mugging. Mm -hmm. And like these stories like, oh, and, you know, literally the Baltimore Sun would have a story about a woman getting her purse snatched. But who is actually at risk? Who is actually, you know, and more and more there, there were stories about um, the violence in inner cities and who was being affected by that. It was black people. My guest is Laura Lippman. The name of the book is Lady in the Lake. It was our first choice for our Get Lit with All of It book club. Let's talk about our protagonist, Maddie. So Maddie's a bit of a polarizing narrator. 
We did an Instagram poll. I don't know if you saw this. No. So we've been on Instagram stories having polls and, and putting up factoids about the this book. Picked a bad month to strip my phone down. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so we asked the poll. More than half of those who responded said they found Maddie to be an unsympathetic character. So it was right down the middle. Uh, here, how many people found Maddie to be kind of unlikable? It's fine. Okay. It's about half and half. What do you think about that, first of all? I'm not surprised by it at all. Uh, I've been asked a lot about my relationship to Maddie. And I've been very frank in saying, Maddie's the person that I fear I could have become. Maddie is a newspaper reporter, which is something I was, or wants to be. She wants to tell a story, and she's so focused on the story she wants to tell that she's utterly incurious about the people that she meets. I mean, I still kind of like her. There's something about her, and I feel that when you see her at the end of the book, this is kind of a, I, I think this is sort of a funny story. Um, I was talking to a Hollywood person who was interested in the book, and he mansplained the end of my own book to me. <laughs> And one of the things he said, it's, it's Maddie's story is tragic. And I said, really? And I guess we're sort of in spoiler category, territory here. I won't be too specific. I said, I mean, this is a book about a time when the choice between love and work could be pretty stark. Sort of the point of the book, that women have to make choices. And they, the, the concept of having it all isn't even articulated. I said, I think Maddie is OK with her choices. I think Maddie's fine with where she ended up. And I sort of admire that about her. I mean, she's not likable. By the way, Maddie, Maddie wouldn't be my friend. Maddie has almost no use for women. I mean, she is one of those incredibly feminine creatures who has spent her entire life depending on men and cultivating. I mean, she, that's literally a line in the novel. I'm going to cultivate the men after she has a bad run-in with a, you know, a female colleague at the newspaper. She's like, oh, women are no good anyway. I'll cultivate the men. So no, she's, she's not particularly likable. You know, I teach writing, and my students are eager to publish. And sometimes the first reaction they get to their novels is, well, your character isn't likable. And I said, yeah, when an editor tells you that, it's like someone telling you that they can't go out on Saturday night because they need to wash their hair. They don't really know what to say. It's not about likable. Is your character interesting? Mm -hmm. Is your character charismatic? I mean, Hannibal Lecter isn't likable, but people have shown that they want to spend time in his company. Uh, so I think, no, Maddie's not particularly likable, but I think she's pretty interesting. What about having the ghost of Cleo, the ghost of Cleo, narrate part of this book? When did that become clear to you that that needed to happen? I realized very early on that since I was writing a book that was essentially a commentary on a woman who was incurious, on a woman who, as Cleo the ghost herself would say, isn't interested in Cleo's life, she's interested in Cleo's death, and they're not the same thing, that Cleo had to be the first and last voice in the book, that she had to book in the book, and that as a crime writer in general, it's really important to me that the victims not just be MacGuffins, devices to create a story. The other day I watched an older, kind of cheesy movie called Malice with Alec Baldwin and Nicole Kidman. I, I, I don't think people remember it. Well, the thing that struck me is there are three female college students who are killed toward the beginning of this film. And the only reason that those murders happen is because there needs to be a reason for the police department to collect a semen sample from Bill Pullman, because that's really important to the plot. So in other words, three <laughs> co-eds have been horribly killed just for a plot point. And even though one of them is Gwyneth Paltrow, I don't think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's like there should be the, the people who die in crime novels should matter. You just don't want this big old pile of bodies sitting over there so that the 
tough, gruff detective can learn to have a little more sympathy and maybe go home and hug his daughter. It's like, dude, there's still 17 dead prostitutes. Mm -hmm. you know, so it really is important to me that victims have a voice, that they live in the book. And in this case, I gave a dead woman a literal voice. And I knew really early on that Cleo not only had to be a voice in the novel, she in some ways had to be the voice. She had to dominate it in a way. And I would hope that people do find Cleo likable, but maybe I'm wrong about that. What do Cleo and Maddie have in common? Well, they're both beautiful. And they both are used to using their beauty to get what they want. They don't necessarily want the same things, but they are aware that they are living in a man's world and that they both just accept that. They don't fight against it. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this is the world I was born into. These are the rules. I'll do what I have to do to get what I want. And I, I think yeah, that's primarily it. But Cleo, Cleo has very different values from Maddie. They want very different things, and they choose very different things. My guest is Laura Lippman. We're talking about her book, Lady in the Lake. Our audience is going to get a chance to ask questions in a little bit. I've got a couple more. Um, something we were talking about, we were sitting around talking about the book, because we actually do that, this team. And uh, we were talking about Maddie just sort of inserting herself in places. And it reminded us of all these true crime podcasts. Did you ever see that joke on Saturday Night Live about white women going places they shouldn't be award? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I am with the drug cartel, and I'm you know, getting the audio of the tires. Um, I was sort of interested in why was she so willing to just put herself in any situation, to your point, kind of regardless of what it meant to anybody else. Yeah she, yeah, she can't even imagine the havoc that she wreaks in other people's life. I mean, Maddie is so spoiled and so entitled, it's never really occurred to her that anything bad could happen to her. And you know, part of this is, it's a reason that there's this backstory about Maddie, about something that happened to her when she was a teenager, something that, had things turned out slightly differently, could have ruined her life, but it didn't. And I think that has made her feel a little bit bulletproof. And so, I mean, she's sometimes conscious of this is a bad neighborhood, this is a little bit tricky, I'm a little bit uncomfortable there, but it just doesn't occur to her that she can't go where she wants, when she wants, and demand of people what she wants. I mean, it is the, it is the absolute, absolute nature of entitlement and privilege to like never question that she can be wherever she wants to be and it doesn't matter. You know, like, like no one, what, why, would, why would she not be able to, why can't I just show up at a psychic's house and um, knock on the door and ask questions? Why can't I just march up the front walk of, you know, this very dignified and lovely woman who has held it together in the wake of this murder investigation that, you know, her husband is sort of rumored to somehow be connected to. Maddie doesn't ever think about anyone else's feelings. You mentioned earlier Loving versus Virginia, and at this time as you write this, interracial marriage was illegal. Right. What did you want to explore about an inter interracial relationship, and, and what kind of things did you have to ask and sort of ruminate on to make sure you got that tone right? You know, the main thing I wanted to explore about Maddie's relationship is that while the fact that it's interracial might be the thing that was uppermost in other people's minds. Maddie is a snob. And the main reason that she likes having this secret relationship has as much to do with the fact that Ferdy is a cop as it does with the fact that he's black. Like, Maddie wants a secret. She doesn't, she had a husband. She, she's done that. She, she likes having a lover who comes and goes who's not making any demands on her, who realistically cannot make any demands on her. She finds it thrilling. And, but the, the, real, the real problem for Maddie is that she cannot see herself as someone who would have a serious relationship with a police officer. Just like, you know, no. Is, you know, she's an upper middle class lady and it would never occur to her to be with a man who doesn't make more money and 
can't provide a certain lifestyle. How long did it take you to write this book? This book took about, well, it's a sad fact that I know to the day when I finished this book. <laughs> Um, I started this book in February of 2017, and I finished it on June 27, 2018, with a major revision that came after that. But that was the day that I submitted it to my editor and my agent. That was going to be my next question. We had Ann Patchett on last week, and she, in her new book, The Dutch House, is great. But she said she wrote almost a whole book and then realized it was a hot mess. Uh, and she, she threw it away. She said, this is, I took a wrong turn early on in my draft. I just took a wrong turn. How do you know, do you have that internal sensor about, oh, I just, uh, the past week has been not useful? I mean, this is tricky. This is the one point where some certain parts, I'm not a normally superstitious person, okay. but I'm not someone who's ever going to claim that I always know what I'm doing. I have been doing this for a long time. I have written more than 20 books. And so what I tell myself is, you've survived it this many times before. You'll survive it again. I do think I have a pretty good instinct mm -hmm. for when things aren't working. And I'm really OK with sort of tearing my book back down to the foundation and starting over. And I don't consider that wasted time. And I don't feel bad about it. I think that might be my newspaper background. You know, you know how it is in news. You get mm. Things just get torn apart and you start over and editors have their way with things and you start over. So this book, once I sort of found the pattern that I wanted, which was this idea that we would see a scene through Maddie's point of view and then see it from the point of view of the other person in the scene, it would be very different. Once I discovered that, that helped a lot. But it was, it was an intense time. I, I just happened on an old journal where I was like, I wrote, oh, I've got three months to turn my book in. I, I think maybe I can do it. So that's where I was like in April of 2018. Like, maybe. Hope so. That's why you had to get the extension on the taxes. <laughs> 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 so we don't want to spoil the ending for anyone who isn't quite done yet. But Stephen King, who reviewed your book in the New York Times, wrote, Lippman answers all outstanding questions with a totally cool double twist that your reviewer, a veteran reader of mysteries, never saw coming. So I don't want to spoil it. How do you master making twists that are both believable and unpredictable? I'm almost hesitant to answer this because I feel like I'm giving away one of my state secrets. Okay. But so the way so the, the, the way to surprise readers is don't try that hard to surprise them. I'm a really big believer in, I call it, you know, Occam's razor. I set up this situation and I think, what would be logical? What is the most reasonable explanation for what's going on? And I'm very conscious of the fact that um, people who read crime fiction, they're super smart. They will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you mm -hmm. because they're used to reading this kind of fiction in which anything potentially could be relevant, could be a clue. So their minds are racing along, you know, 90 miles an hour, like, what about this? What about that? Does that matter? 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 And they're making it more complicated than it is. So I often find by having a reveal that when you think about it, it's like, oh, well, of course that's what was happening. Of course that's the answer. And I really, I think I learned this from my father in an indirect way. He had read one of my books. And he said, boy, did that ending surprise me. I could have sworn that somebody else is going to turn out to have been the person who was responsible for what happened in chapter one. And I said, but I told you in chapter one who did it. And he said, I didn't believe you. So I was, <laughs> I was like, like, OK, then. Like, you know, I sort of realized that there's this, you know, we talk about entertainment being interactive as if that's a new concept. But reading has always been interactive. Reading has always been something that depends on a person picking up a book and really immersing themselves. I mean, it's, it's much different to read a book than it is to watch the best television show, the best film. And I know there's all this great TV now, and it can be complicated and hard to follow, and it encourages people to have all these theories. But there's still something really special about the relationship between a reader and a book.
My guest is Laura Lippman. We've been talking about her new novel, The Lady in the Lake. Coming up next, we will take some questions from the audience, then fall book recommendations from Emma Straub. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Okay, we've got Mike Runners in the audience, Simon, who you hear me talk about quite often, who I outed as a classics major on one of the shows, and Jordan, who has been running the Instagram account for the book club. She's the queen of the book club. Um, okay, let's come back. And also, audience, just so you know, Laura has agreed to stick around and sign books after the show. So stay with us for the, she'll be in the lobby after our musical performance. All right, here we go. Three, two. This is all of it on WNYC. We are back. I'm speaking with author, sorry. We are back. I've been speaking with author Laura Lippman about her new novel, Lady in the Lake, which was our first book club choice for Get Lit with All of It. We have a live studio audience here. We've got questions from the audience, from our book club members. Who wants to ask a question? Oh, I'm the daughter of a school teacher. I will call on someone. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Hi, thanks so much for all the background that you provided tonight about um, the year 1966 and the racial backdrop to really give even more context than you provided in the book, which, which was rich in the book as well. And one aspect that I'm curious to hear more about from you tonight is um, Maddie's Jewish upbringing and the fact that it didn't really seem to have much bearing on her in her adult life, but certainly factored prominently for both Tessie and Maddie's background. Great. Well, one other inspiration for this book was Marjorie Morningstar, which is a book I love and re had read many, many times over. The past few books I've written have sort of had this secondary agenda in which I'm exploring a classic novel that I love. I wrote a book called Wild Lake, which basically imagined the events of To Kill a Mockingbird if they'd occurred in a liberal suburb in 1980. How would the story have played out there? Sunburn was my homage to James Cain. What happens if the mysterious drifter passing through town is a beautiful woman instead of a man? And then I started thinking about Marjorie Morningstar, a book I love and a book you know not a lot of people read anymore. Um, Herman Woke just died this year at the age of, I believe, 103, and he had this really interesting career where he wrote lots of you know he wrote this big war saga. He wrote a book that Jimmy Buffett attempted to turn into a musical. I mean, he's, he wrote about the um, super collider in Texas. <laughs> so he had this one novel about a, a young Jewish girl in New York in the 1930s who wanted to become an actress and made a mistake of sleeping with the wrong man and it almost ruined her life. And there's a scene at the end of the book where he turns point of view over to the boy who yearned after Marjorie and could never get her and he sees her and he just or tells the story of seeing her as a happily married woman. And I thought, I wonder what Marjorie's view of that story is. And I thought about the way that you see someone from your past and it can bring all of this stuff up. So yeah, Marjorie's, Marjorie, Maddie, my character, her Jewishness is of a type that would have been pretty common in mid-century Baltimore where people would have sort of gone through the motions of being kosher, except they're really not. A couple of people have written my editor, and they've pointed out that Maddie's not really kosher. And I'm like, yeah, I know. That's sort of, <laughs> that's sort of the joke that she's pretending to keep a kosher kitchen for Milton, but she's actually breaking the dietary laws in all sorts of ways. And like, um, one of the stories that a friend of mine told me once about growing up Jewish in Baltimore was that it was okay to have crab feasts because you were outside eating on newspaper. Like, you know, <laughs> obviously you wouldn't have to observe Jewish dietary law if you were outside eating off a newspaper. So Maddie represents that sort of Judaism, which is it's more cultural than anything else. And for Milton, it's more important. And then for someone like Tessie, it's, it's very important. She comes from a truly, so I kind of wanted to have all of those gradations of Jewishness in Baltimore in the 1950s and 60s. Um, I guess I should explain, I, am, I was not brought up in the Jewish faith. My grandfather was the child of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who ended up in Montgomery, Alabama 
And he just never really cared about it. He married into a Protestant family. And my father was raised as a Methodist. And my dad worked at the Baltimore Sun. And he worked alongside the man that I'm now married to. And David and I had dated for a long time when it came up. He's like, what do you mean your father's not Jewish? I'm like, well, he's just not, David. And he's like, he's like he looks like a little old Jewish man. And I'm like, I'm like well, um, you try to explain that to him. You know, David had grown up with a father who worked for B'nai B'rith. So a, lot of, a lot of what I write about Judaism has sort of come to me through marriage. And, you know, I'm raising my daughter in, in a synagogue in Baltimore. So as my, my, our rabbi said, Laura, wasn't that our synagogue in your book? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? Right here. Simon's behind you. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm just curious why you would make her so unlikable. Like, I enjoyed the book, I loved the writing, but I really didn't like her. And even her, even as a mom, like, she had no... Oh, no, it's awful. Yeah. She leaves Seth behind. She's a <laughs> terrible mother. You know, pity my poor husband. I've written two books in a row about a woman who bolts her marriage and leaves her child behind. Um, you know, I, as a reader... I don't like super perfect people. I, you know, there's, there's this wonderful parody. It's in a book by a writer named Sarah Bird that um, was based on her own attempts to, to write romance novels. And you know, there's sort of this description of the classic romance hero. It's like, you know, she's, she's a restless soul who when she's troubled, she just can't, you know, it, it's just that super perfect person. I don't like them. I don't like them in life. I don't like them in my reading. And I also, like, I have a lot of respect for readers. And I don't like to make things too easy on readers. It's so, I like, I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to keep from being a writer who allows the reader to feel self-congratulatory. And when you create a character like Maddie, I guess what I'm hoping is that people will be open-minded enough to say, am I like this? Am I incurious? Do I sit in a diner and never stop to think that the woman who's pouring me coffee has a life story and it might not be what I expect? And I don't expect most of my readers to be like that, but just to even make them a little bit uncomfortable. Um, I came out of journalism, and there's an old maxim in journalism about how you should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And I think I sort of carry that forward into fiction. Um, so I just thought it was more interesting if Maddie wasn't that likable. I, I don't, I, I, she just showed up. She showed up the way she was. She's kind of infuriating, <laughs> but she's spoiled. She's a very spoiled person, and I think that's how she would be. I think she's a little nicer at the end, a little bit. There's, there's something about her when we catch a glimpse of her in the future where I, I think she's been softened and a little bit chastened by her life experiences. Let's try to slide in one more question. Jordan, right there. Hi, thanks. Um, I was sort of pleasantly surprised towards the end when Ferdy seemed to really fall in love with her. And we're talking a lot about how she was unlikable. And I was sort of taken aback, too, when he really fell for her. I was sort of thrilled for her. I thought, oh, wow, this is it for her. But then, so what... What did he fall in love with about her? Or do you think he was just under her, her wiles? You know, she was sort of under his wiles, too. Remember, he tells her to go iron her hair, and she does. <laughs> and, you know, he, he, you know, he has very definite ideas about how she is most attractive to him and what he likes about her. Yeah, he likes her to keep, keep a few pounds on, go and iron your hair. Um, and even like has a whole story for, for what she should tell the woman who irons her hair, how she found out about her. I think, I think the thing that Ferdy loved about Maddie is that he saw through her the moment he met her. He knew there was no missing ring. And there was something vulnerable in this woman who for whatever reason has decided to fake a burglary. 
you know, clearly she's not in good shape to do that. And she risks a lot. And I think he also picks up on her that, you know, she's, she has a really wanton, sensual nature that, that is a draw for him. And I think he's touched by her ambition because he's ambitious too. And if there is a tragedy in the novel, it's that Maddie, in her ambition, has no respect for Ferdy's ambition. She really doesn't get it. She has no idea how she undercuts him. If Maddie doesn't do what she does in the book, Ferdy probably will be on track to become one of those first African-American police officers who could rise up in the ranks and become a detective. And he would have been a good one. So there's a certain sense of like, drawn to like, two very ambitious people. And I think also that they have that advantage of having a relationship that's hidden from the world that allows them just to enjoy one another and not, they don't have any work-a-day worries. Um, I will tell you, and if this makes me sound grossly sentimental, so be it. I walk past the corner where Maddie and Ferdy said goodbye to each other very often. And I'm always a little bit sad when I do. Laura, you mentioned you were talking to a Hollywood type who mansplained the ending of mm -hmm. your book to you, which means you were talking to a Hollywood type. I, I have been talking to Hollywood types. I'm not sure I'm allowed to say anything. But I will say that Hollywood type didn't get very far with me. Okay. Not that one. I, but the, there, is, there is definitely a lot of really gratifying interest in this book. Um, it does help a lot, I think, to have Stephen King saying nice things about you in the New York Times book review. So, you know, fingers crossed, and we'll see where it goes. All right. We know Gwyneth Paltrow is not playing Maddie. <laughs> For the record, I said it was wrong to kill one of the Paltrow as a plot point. <laughs> do you, I, just when you think about an actress, we, we do this all the time. Who would be Maddie? You know, it's funny because I'm really bad at that. Okay. I'm like shockingly bad at it. And it's almost an advantage, though, because I do have like several properties sort of floating around Hollywood. And the fact that I've never imagined anyone in those roles makes me super open to some pretty unusual casting. And people will run stuff by me, and I'm like, sure, why not? Because I'm not, I, I, I really, I seldom think that way. I seldom see real, real actors in, in my work. I see the people I created. And I, I'm really, I'm really, and I'm willing to let go. You know, I'm willing to say, okay, now it will become a different thing, and that's okay, too. Well, fingers crossed we'll all get to watch this on a screen somewhere. Thank you all for your questions. And of course, thank you, Laura Lippman, for being oh, here. Wow. <laughs> what an honor. The name of the book is Lady in the Lake. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with Emma Straub and her fall book picks. This is all of it. So much. And Laura's going to stick around, sign books after uh, the end of our event, which should probably be like another 30 minutes or so. So Emma's coming out next. All righty. Hey. Good. Do you want a glass of wine? Um, I'm going to have water. Okay. Oh, okay. You're a grown up. Oh, you look so pretty. Hello. Yeah, we had a little wine wipe out, but it's okay. It's all good. I think I broke your water dispenser. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay. Hey, Booth, I'm going to start. OK. Three, two. This is the Get Lit With All Of It book club meeting number one. Our audience is full. And you know people who are here tonight, and definitely our radio audience, they love books. We know you have a mile high stack on your nightstand, and you can't wait to get to the new hot one. And joining us now to give us a preview of what fall books you should 
definitely check out is author herself, best-selling author and owner of Books Are Magic, Emma Straub. Emma, thanks Hi. for being here. What's the big fall book trend? What are you seeing? Oh, trends. I don't know. In my bookstore, I, I think the trend is like how perfectly we can build a pyramid of books in the in the on the front table. Um, I don't know if I can speak to a trend, um, but I guess the the trend that's happening in the fall is what happens every fall, which is publishers lose their mind with excitement and publish. <laughs> all their super heavy hitters all at once. Um, you would think that they would like try to space it out a little bit, but they don't. They're just like, here we go. It's like <laughs> award season coming up, like boom. Christmas, holidays. I get, I mean, if you want to be it, right? cynical about it. Sometimes. I think it's that they love September and <laughs> October, but I guess suppose it also has to do with Christmas presents, yes. What books are flying out of Books or Magic? Um, lots of them. So uh, just this week and last week, um, so Ann Patchett's uh, new novel, The Dutch House, that's the one that like I am psychotically recommending to people. Like if they walk in the store and then just like l turn their head a certain way, I'm like, oh, I know what you need. <laughs> <laughs> you need The Dutch House. <laughs> um, just because I love her. Uh, but that's... By no means. I know, read it in one day. Was that you read, read it in one, one day. day? Oh god, I was obsessed. Isn't that the best feeling? I love that feeling so much. Um, other things that are flying. Um, so Tanahisi Coates, who everyone knows for his nonfiction, um, has published his first novel called The Water Dancer. That's been flying off the shelves. Um, What's that about? Um, you know what I. <laughs> I haven't read it. Oh my gosh. Um, oh my gosh. I'm. That is. I got stumped. I got stumped. I can't. I can't give a proper plot summary. You're but busy you know writing who can, them. But you know who can? Is Oprah. <laughs> Oprah. I think Oprah heard that you were starting a book club, Allison, and she was like, "You know what? Wait a minute. Um, I'm gonna bigfoot this now. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna <laughs> just jump right in there." Um, wait, but other things that are selling, I'm just thinking about like our best sellers. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we can talk about things that are like still coming that I'm really excited about. I also have a cheat sheet in my pocket. Go for um, it. It's radio. Oh, it's radio. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's also on my telephone, which makes me feel millennial. Okay. No one, no one tell anyone that I'm doing this. Okay. Um, well, one thing that came out earlier this summer, there are two books that came out earlier this summer. Should I talk about that? No, sure. I shouldn't. Um, that we have just like continued selling our Ocean Vongs on Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous and um, Taffy Brodesar Ackner's Fleischman is in Trouble. Those ones are just like boom, boom, boom. That'll just like keep going. Um, oh, another, another novel that is, that just came out a couple of weeks ago is Jacqueline Woodson's Red at the Bone. Um, that it's so beautiful. So Jacqueline Woodson is, if you aren't already in love with her, um, you know, she she has written books for everyone. She's written picture books. She's written middle grade books. She's written YA books um, and novels for grownups. And this new one is a family story in Brooklyn, complicated, beautiful, lyrical as always. It's so good. <coughs> book club. <coughs> Might be. Okay. Possibly. I, okay. Okay. I won't. Book club. <laughs> um, just saying. Just saying. Yeah. I'm curious about the Margaret Atwood book. Oh, yeah. I mean, so, okay. Right. That Margaret Atwood, I don't know if you've heard, it's sort of underground. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret Atwood has written a sequel um, to The Handmaid's Tale called The Testaments. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I read an interview with her recently where you know she said that it, it wasn't it, it wasn't something that she had been planning and that it sounds like it it was actually um like it sort of grew out of the television adaptation actually that she that there were characters that had been minor characters in in the first book that sort of because television is what it is and they have to make things last longer um you know minor characters become more more important and that she found herself interested in those voices um and those characters and so then she 
you know, decided to go back afterwards, which seems like kind of um, brain breaking in a certain way. Like Margaret Atwood chose to do this based on, I, I mean, you know, but when you're Margaret Atwood, you can do whatever you want and everyone will be very excited. Um, another person who can do whatever they want and I will be very excited is Zadie Smith. Oh, I know, everyone <laughs> moans, moans with pleasure. Um, so Zadie Smith is another one of these humans um, who has no limits and she has written novels and essays and nonfiction and this fall, um, it's October 8th, is publishing her first collection of short stories called Grand Union. Um, and I am so excited. Just like she, she just, she has one of those brains where like I will follow, I will follow her anywhere. Then you want to be listening to all of it on October 8th at 1220 <laughs> because Zadie Smith will be okay. in studio according to my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and Emma Straub will be standing directly outside the studio <laughs> with her autograph book. Um, yeah, I, that's exciting. I love her so much. Oh, okay, two other ones that are very different and very exciting. Okay, so speaking of sequels, um, I don't know what's going on. Something's in the water because all of these literary geniuses are writing sequels. Um, so in addition to Margaret Atwood, um, this fall, Elizabeth Strout is publishing a sequel to Olive Kittredge. It's called Olive Again. Yay! <laughs> um, and this book, you know, I, I loved Olive Kittredge when it came out. I, so did other people. It won the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> you know, I'm not alone. Um, <laughs> but, but I, but I, ha I don't know. I, I mean, it's one of, it, I hadn't reread it since, it since it came out. And so when I read I read the galley for Olive again. I was amazed at how instantly I was back. Like it, I, it took no time. After the first page, I was like, oh, oh right, she knows how to do this so well. And it, um, it, it functions in the same way that um, Olive Kittredge did, which if you remember is, it's, it's sort of um, story-like short stories that sort of add up to a novel wherein um, Elizabeth Strout will, you know, follow a character. Maybe it's Olive, but it also could not be um, around. And if, if she's following a different character, then Olive will eventually pop up and, like, be cantankerous on the streets of Maine. <laughs> and it's great. <laughs> I have more. Can I keep going? Yeah, I'm just going to reintroduce you, okay? Okay, sure. My guest is Emma Straub author and owner of Books Are Magic. We're getting a fall preview. What else do you think we should okay. be checking out? Um, so really, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, talk, talking about it with you now, I realize that so many people on my list are, um, you know, doubly or triply talented. Um, and the next one is Saeed Jones, who um, published an incredible poetry collection called Prelude to Bruise. Um, a few years ago, maybe three years ago. I could be wrong. Um, but he has a memoir coming out on October 8th called How We Fight for Our Lives. And um, I mean, you know, when poets write prose, it's just better. It's just better <laughs> than when the rest of us schlubs do it. Um, and it's a story about growing up gay and black and... Um, in a place where uh, his family, and he, it's in the South, and his family didn't um, appreciate the gayness. Mm. And uh, it's a really complicated love story, really, between Saeed and his mother, um, who, I mean, it's just, it's just like a, it's a beautiful, just heartbreaking love story. I won't tell you what happens. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just one of those books where you just you read it and you sort of are mentally or physically underlining phrases. And yeah, I just I think he's he's um, a really important voice in American letters. I want to ask about your new novel as much as you can tell me. It's, I know it comes out in 2020, <laughs> and I know it's called All Adults Here. True, those These are true. These things are true. These Those things are true. The internet did not lie. <laughs> 
Yes, um, I have a new novel uh, out in May called All Adults Here. Um, it is an intergen or multi generational family story. It takes place um, in the Hudson Valley, um, just just a little up from where we are now. Um, yeah, you know, it's 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 just the kind of story that I love to tell, which is like um, well meaning families um, making mistakes. Um, and uh, yeah, it's about parenthood and love and sex and all that kind of good stuff. And do you have, is there a pub date yet? Is May 5th. I think it's May 5th. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Mark your, mark your calendar. You mark your calendar. <laughs> You're coming back here. <laughs> Zadie Smith better be standing outside. Wait, no, no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding, Zadie, please. <laughs> Well, Emma has been such a fantastic partner at Books Are Magic for this, this book club that we're doing. And um, so I want to let you know what books you need to get in stock because we're ready to announce book number two <gasps> and book number three. Oh, my gosh. I'm Are very, you ready? I'm very okay. excited. So our second choice for Get Lit With All Of It book club number two is Deepak Chopra's, and the book is called Meta Human. Meta Human by Deepak Chopra. He will be our guest on Thursday, October 24th. Wow. So you got three weeks to read it, everybody. <laughs> Book number three will be Jacqueline Woodson. Whee! Red at the Bone. Meet us back here Friday, November 22nd. Ooh, a Friday. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> 7 p.m. Jacqueline will be here for our third Get Lit, Get Lit with all of it, that's the name of it, yes, Get Lit with All of It <laughs> Book Club. Deepak Chopra, number two, Jacqueline Woodson, number three. And of course, if you're local, you can get them all at Books Are Magic in Brooklyn. Emma, I love when you come and visit. Thanks for having me. Up next, a music performance from the folk trio Joseph Stay With Us. We'll be right back. <laughs> books about either. I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't even help you. I was like, I... No worries. Yeah, go team. Yeah, go team. I want to read all those books. I know, right? <laughs> all right, see you later, Emma. Okay. Get out of there. way. Check, check. Am I in your space? Yeah. Check, check, check. That's weird. No, I can't really hear myself. Oh, shizzy. Yeah. Let me know when you got
check, check, check. I don't like it. Check, check, there it is. Yeah. Check. Okay. Yeah. Good to go? All right. Okay, I'm going to count you in on an intro and then let you guys do your thing. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> This is all of it on WNYC. Up next with the get lit of all of it. I had wine. Sorry. Okay, so I tried not to drink it. It was too good. Okay. <laughs> Three, two. This is the Get Lit with All of It book club. I'm Allison Stewart. And up next, we have the rock trio Joseph, Allison Klosner, Megan Klosner, and Natalie Klosner Shepman. They are three sisters from Portland, Oregon. Their self-titled released, their self, oh Jesus. <laughs> their self-released, <laughs> they self-released their first album, Native Dreamer Kin, in 2014, a set of acoustic songs that showed off their sublime harmonies. For their next album, I'm Alone, No You're Not, they got a record deal and worked with producer and Bright Eyes band member Mike Mogus, who helped them bring out a more electric sound to their folk rock. The album was a breakthrough for them with their song, White Flag, so good, and Canyon racking up millions of plays online. You can go ahead and clap for that. <laughs> now they've continued their path into bigger, grittier musical territory with their new album, Good Luck Kid. But even with all the album's energy and intensity, Joseph stayed grounded in the human elements and tight harmonies that first made them such a compelling act. As NPR wrote after the release of I'm Alone, No You're Not, as gorgeous as the sisters sound on the album, it's a revelation to hear them live. Oh. So, you are lucky because here is Joseph live. Thank you so much. <laughs> If I would have known what I know now, would I do it again? Revive some openness from my broken wish, still it's bound to backfire. I'll admit what I don't
try and look over here at you all as well. <laughs> <laughs> this song's called Green Eyes. One, two, three, four. Could have been the way the moonlight, the dashboard, passing to window, roll down. That got me thinking there's something we should talk about. It's not worth waiting out. I can give you space if you need it. You can walk away. I'm not leaving. There's pride in my mouth. I got you should chase, but I swallow it now. And I'll be first to say. vision of the three of you in the back of like a station wagon. Oh, we were wow. little, just. I wish. It was a very large SUV. <laughs> <laughs> we have a brother too, and we had lots of animals, so it was a party. <laughs> when did it become clear to you, the three of you, that you were gonna do this together? Not it's until like 2013. 13, yeah. Mm -hmm. What was it about that year? What happened? Well, I, um, I'm Natalie, I'm the eldest, and... You said so? <laughs> I said so, that's exactly right. <laughs> no, I'd been, I'd been touring um, by myself, doing house show tours and things, and I was working on my own solo career, and a friend of mine uh, gave me pause. He stopped me and said, it seems like you don't really believe in what you're doing. It's like you'll play a song and you kind of look out in the audience being like, 
mm, what do you think, you know? And he was like, what would it take for you to believe in this and want to run it into people's hands? And in that moment, I thought about me and Allie, and I was like, they're not really doing, doing anything. anything. <laughs> I could cool. wear really, but yeah. super cool. <laughs> you know. So I didn't look this up because I I didn't want to know. I wanted to oh, hear it from that. you guys. Yeah. Joseph? Joseph. Yeah, yeah. Joseph. It's you a say. yeah, it's a town in Oregon, in the northeastern corner of Oregon that our grandpa Joe is from. It's, it's like J O. Yeah, yeah. It's like the most beautiful secret in Oregon. Yeah. So they don't tell it, anyone. Yeah, don't tell anyone. <laughs> Yeah, I think they call hide. it Little Switzerland because yeah. it's just like there's a lake, there's like rolling hills, there's snow-capped mountains behind it. It's insane. Oh, next book club's there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> do you believe in this idea of blood harmonies? Yeah, that, yeah. yeah, yeah, I do. Definitely. Why? What do you think it is um, about this? Is it, is it genetics? Is it that you just have lived with each other? The idea of blood harmonies yeah. is that siblings have a, a unique sound together when they sing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's because we were all taught to speak by the same people how to talk i guess yeah you like did i say yeah. that right yeah yeah absolutely oh my god i'm like there's a bunch of really smart people reading books here <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> which by the way i realized as we were singing the bridge of that last song thought i could read you but i lost my place we're on different pages i noticed that too i, I was like, like oh perfect. perfect i guess this is the song metaphor. for a book club <laughs> that's the perfect metaphor <laughs> only the cool book clubs though. yeah exactly <laughs> Your new album, tell us a little bit about it, yeah. what's new about it for people who are fans of their music, yeah. for people who are experiencing the first time, yeah. what will they get? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's, um, you know, it's got a bigger sonic palette than the last one. We, uh, we started out just this way, you know, an acoustic guitar, three voices, and so the writing was really about that. And then on I'm Alone or You're Not, we had all this incredible support from our team and we had this opportunity to play with a band. And our minds were blown. We were like, oh, you can get this big, you can get this you know, wide with these sounds, and you can be in an audience with people who want to throw their fists in the air and want to like clutch their chests. And how do we create songs and, and music that will be big enough for that moment in that room? Mm -hmm. So this, um, you know, this album definitely was a response to that. And it's called Good Luck Kid. It's the... You know, for me, my personal experience entering my 30s, feeling like, oh, I'm definitely supposed to be the adult now, and yet I do not feel like one. And um, all the trepidation that comes along with that and the songs are about all of that. And will you be touring with the record? We will, yeah. yeah. We're on the tour we, at yeah. the moment. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for folks who are listening in the local area... We just played here at Webster Hall on, yeah, I know, I know on Saturday. I know. Yeah. And when are you coming back around? And well, there's as not a date yet, much as possible. Okay. Yeah. So and if know. people want to know more about you, more information, where should they go? Thebandjoseph.com or the band. the band Joseph on Instagram. Yes. Or on it, we're the first thing that comes up when you type Joseph now. Woo! Really <laughs> nice SEO. <laughs> Good job, good. ladies. Yes. <laughs> Had a lot of help with that one. I know. Pass a lot of Josephs for that one. <laughs> Will you play a few more songs for us? Yeah, we would love absolutely. to. Thank you. This is Joseph. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> we would love to uh, bring you back to the moment when this song was written, which was at a New Year's Eve party. So if um, Gabe and Gaines will indulge and you would turn on the disco ball, that would be amazing. <laughs> Just 
face Making something good out of pain You and me and the rest of this mess It's just another night Dressed up in glitter, such a pretty picture It's just another night Happy and sad, is it too much to ask? So this is the new year And I don't feel any different I don't really feel a whole year older now I'm still shaking but I'm bold now I need you to hold me even closer now I know we'll make it Another year, though I don't know how. Ba 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 that disco ball was perfect. Thank you. Yes, I love it. Okay. I love it. That perfect. sounds great. <laughs> we'll send you off with this, uh, this last one. It's been an absolute joy to be here with you guys. This song uh, came from a moment when my best friend had a baby, and I was holding him, and I realized how helpless and how not of his own will he had arrived at this place. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just felt this overwhelming primal desire to protect him like I never wanted him to hurt ever and um, I realized someone must have held me and thought something like that about me and how hard I am on myself how, how hard we all are on ourselves and each other but we all came like that and uh, unless you know something I don't we didn't ask to come here but we're making the most of it so this song is called Room For You I hope to God the world will make some room for you I hope you see in colors that that world sees through You know I'll be right here holding this dream for you I hope to God the world will make some Even if we lose touch, we fall off the tracks You gotta know that you're still loved even if you can't love back All these lonely aching feelings should never belong to you Never belong to you You never get so broke you don't know what to do I hope you find someone who always sees the better side of you You know that I'm right here holding these dreams for you The curtain might be closing but they're showing through All these only aching feelings should never belong to you, 
Thanks to Emma Straub, and of course, thanks to the lady of the evening, Laura Libin. And thanks to you, the audience, for coming out for the Get Lit with All of It Book Club. I'm Allison Stewart, and I will see you next time. Woo!